Emily Kisling. I get uh, all this realism. I just, I can't handle realism. <laughs> I read two poems. First one is called Praise. I'm learning to play the violin. I sound like a tone deaf person wearing big job gloves. When I play, I have no fear at all, no fear of failure. If I quit due to lack of talent or interest, nobody will care one way or another. Yehudi Menuhin won't care, neither will Yitzhak Perelman. Will anybody ever say, boy, that was some sweet violin? I'm guessing nobody will ever say that. Sometimes I get an earache just listening to myself. Still, I practice and I imagine. I'm good at that. But sometimes, by accident, my finger joins the string. And the bow slides slowly and the most perfect note sings like heaven. Suffering in the world disappears for a moment, replaced by peace and praise. Last night, I dreamed I played the national anthem at a baseball game. After all the ruckus, after the field had been swept of beer bottles and litter, I was arrested by Homeland Security and sent to a dark cell in Yemen, where they asked again and again for the Star Spangled Banner. I played it a dozen times. They howled with laughter, then went outside and shot their guns in the air. <laughs> um, this poem is called The Adjunct Professors. <laughs> the adjunct professors have assembled painted wagons in a long line on Cleveland Avenue that reaches nearly a mile. Their leader, a short bald man, rides his gray gelding the length of the parade wearing his black robe and just for today his burgundy sash and velvet tan. Regalia fluttering in the spring breeze as he makes his way from one family to the next. He stops to tighten a harness here to check water barrels there. The wooden wagons are painted with constellations, castles and sailing ships rounding the horn, mushrooms and minarets, hamlets, dead father pointing into the gathering fog. On the driver's benches, men and women finger the reins, release wooden brakes, and turn their thoughts to Demosthenes, to Anne Boleyn, to Yeats and Bishop, to Faulkner and Flannery O'Connor, and, and to other guides, Galileo and Cervantes, Edwin Hubble, Frank O'Hara, and the wagons begin to roll. They are heavy with books, ideas, fossils and figurines, the biographies of saints, liars and clowns, of Clements and Whitman and Poe. But now the ponies strain to pull. Hysteresis unfolds them into traffic. Their wooden wheels with iron rims strike sparks like small lightning. They must make 20 miles a day to find a place near a river to build a camp, to make ready for winter by fires where they will write their lives and retell pilgrim stories, Chaucer, Blake, Wilfred Owen, Jack Kerouac, Amelia Earhart, and Holden Caulfield. They will curse and sing in many languages. They will pray to the gods now interned at Parnassus, fold paper cranes, scratch equations in the dirt. Here, on the sidewalk, we watch them leave. We now regret the classes we skipped, books we didn't read. We failed to find X. We were baffled. We were baffled by science. We didn't quite learn French. We couldn't find Copenhagen on a map. And now they are going. They are smarter than us. That much we know. And so the question hangs in the air with their dust. Are we smart enough to follow them or smart enough to not follow the adjunct professors westward ho to the learned empty prairie?